We are praying. As you know, the Delta virus is just going crazy. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we do ask for your prayers. We ask for your patience. We ask for your understanding. Our medical experts are letting us know it probably will not be any time before the end of September. So we do ask that you be flexible, that you be patient. But we are believing that we shall see each other's face again. And so God bless you on today. Uh, thank Reverend Robertson for reading our scripture. If you can go back to Revelation, the 21st chapter. And we want to look at that um, fifth verse, Revelations 21, 5. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making all things new. And then he said unto me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. He also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give the springs of the water of life without charge. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I want to focus in on the, uh, that verse that says, To all who are thirsty, I will give them springs of the water of life without charge. And the people of God said, amen and amen. Now, Lord, have your way. The people, men and women, boys and girls watching literally across the world who need to hear a word from you. So hide me behind your cross. Then I ask that you speak to me and through me that somehow this earthen vessel shall not be a part of what it is that you're saying to the people of God. We ask and pray that in Jesus' name that... Whatever you do, you'll increase it, bless it, anoint it, and empower it. We say thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We want to use as our sermon topic today of uh, perfected praise. Perfected praise. Perfected praise. On today, uh, we have been going through the month of August starting in the 21st chapter of Revelation. And in the 21st chapter of Revelation, John begins by telling us what he sees. He says he sees a new heaven. He sees a new earth. He sees a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a beautiful bride prepared for her husband. So the first thing John sees is something new. The heavens are new. Uh, uh, the uh, new Jerusalem is new. And then uh, last Sunday we talked about how John not, no longer sees, but he hears. And so he says he hears from on the throne room uh, that there's a mighty shout. And the shout is taking place because God himself is going to be amongst his people. He's going to move in with you. He's going to uh, sit down, going to get into his favorite chair and just be there with you. And that when he comes, he's going to wipe away all sorrow. I shouldn't even say wipe away. He's going to remove all sorrow, all pain, all crying. Death will be no more. And all the evils that men and women have had to face and suffer shall be gone forever. But today, ah, I don't know about you, but today it is saying that God in himself is getting ready to talk. Now, I'm glad that John saw something. I'm glad that John heard something. But now God is getting ready to talk. And when God gets ready to talk, it's like, yeah, if I, I want to listen. Anybody besides me today want to listen to what God is getting ready to say? And, and so God says, I am going to make all things new. I made heaven and earth new. I made Jerusalem new. I've come to sup with you and, and I made you. But today, it's going to be something I'm going to do that's perfected. I, I want you to know, John, this is so important. I'm not going to trust it to your memory. I want you to write it down. I want you to make sure that there can't be any mistake of what I'm telling you. Because the first thing I want you to know, it is finished. <laughs> 
and, and, and so we really are going back to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. Uh, we, we, even in our studies in which we talk, greater is coming. Behold, I'm making all things new. Can't you see it? <laughs> and, and then some of you remember in 2 Corinthians uh, where it says in the 5th chapter, it goes on to say, anytime you are a new person in Christ, old things pass away. And behold, you become brand new. So this whole idea of us becoming new it is something that has been in the old testament something that paul has been talking about in the new testament and, and now god is saying it's finished and some of you remember jesus saying it from the cross in the 19th chapter in the 30th verse of john it is finished so the question is god what is finished what is finished now is the fact that what started all the way back in the garden of eden i have now perfected the whole purpose of me creating you was for you to be in fellowship with me. And in the Garden of Eden, that fellowship was broken. And it's a terrible thing to have broken fellowship. It's a terrible thing to no longer be in relationship, to no longer have the relationship with someone you love as you would like it to be. And many of us have had to deal with these broken relationships in our families, broken relationships on our jobs, broken relationships in our school, and it's terrible. Uh, Reverend Washington, just come for a second. Reverend Washington is my brother. We're tight, everything's going around. We, all right. And then something happens. Sometimes we don't even know what happened. But broken relationships. And, and, and for whatever reason, we no longer are conversating. We no longer have fellowship with one another. And Dr. Boyd, as you can come, Dr. Boyd is my sister. We've had a wonderful relationship growing up. But something happens. We, sometimes you don't even know. And the next thing you know, it's... And, and, and even though you may not act like it, it grieves you. Uh, I'm going to ask that Reverend uh, Taylor would come at this time. Uh, Reverend Taylor is a friend. And we, we were buddies, and, but then all of a sudden something happens. And, and the relationship is broken. And the sad thing is sometimes you don't even know what it is. Uh, Minister Robeson, if you could come. Minister Robeson is my son. And here it is, my son. And something happens. And we have broken relationship. It, it's a terrible thing when the relationship with those who are nearest and dear to you, it can be relationships of friends, husbands, wives. It's, but it's another thing when you have a broken relationship with God. And, and, and God is saying in the Garden of Eden, Satan caused men and women, boys and girls, to have a broken relationship with me. And if you go back to the third chapter of Genesis, you see that everything God created was at the disposal of Adam and Eve, everything. So if you could imagine this church, everything that's here is, is at my disposal. Not, not only in this sanctuary, there's a 70,000 square feet of, of this whole complex, whole church area. So everything on the third floor, God says you can have everything on the second floor, everything in the sanctuary, everything in the basement. Not only that, every, we have 80 acres of land, all 80 acres of land you have access to. We have 10 buildings, all 10 buildings you have access to. Everything that, that, that is here, you, it's yours. I, I've given it to you. I want you to enjoy it. But the only thing I ask that you will not take part of is this one plan. Everything else, that one plan. And, and, and you're fine. Everything is going good. And then Satan, the deceiver, comes and says, you mean God told you you can't have none of this? Satan always exaggerates God's blessings in the sense that he's trying to make you think that the love of God does not extend to you in its fullest extent. So he's trying to limit what God has for you and the love that God has to you. And Eve says, no, that ain't right. You deceiver that. You know that's not right. The only thing I cannot have partake of is this. And that's the knowledge of good and evil. And because of this, God says, just, just, just trust me. I, I, you should not partake of this because this belongs to the only to me, God. And so everything else but that. And, and, and I don't know about you, but if you had a mother and father like me, we lived in the 
Roxbury section of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Reverend Washington, and, and Boston was kind of like, uh, Roxbury was kind of like Southeast, and I was, we lived there when I was six and seven. And, uh, and so when it got dark in the wintertime, about 5.30, my mother would say, you have to come in when the street lights come on. But in the summer, she would say, you would have to be in by seven o'clock. It'd be terrible. Two more hours of sunlight, everybody else is playing. My mother, and I couldn't go further than her eyesight. Uh, my nickname was Greg. Greg, come on in. And my friends would look at me. You got to come in. And, and yet, Mom, I don't want, come on in. And then I walk in all mad. You ain't fair. You, you don't treat me. All the other kids' parents, let them stay outside. You so mean. I, I, I didn't understand that her love for me was keeping me from a situation that could be detrimental to me. And, and we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts and lived there for two years. So within that four-year period, I would go back and four of my friends died. One jumped on, you know, Boston, they had these trolley cars and you could jump up on the back of the bus and hold on Well, he fell off and died. Another got hit by a car. And when we go back, some, sometimes we wouldn't even, they would just say, my daddy left, my mama left. It, she was, she knew the dangers of the community in which we were living. And so even though I didn't understand it, she was protecting me literally from myself. Some of you heard, the older I get, the wiser my daddy becomes. That's what God is saying. There are some things that are left to my purview. There are some things, and I can't always tell you why, but just don't eat from this tree. And Satan says, you mean God says you can't? And so because he says that, the focus gets to what you can't have instead of all that you can. The focus is not the 70 square feet, 70,000 square feet. It's, it's not the 80 acres. It, it's, it, it's not the 10 buildings. It's, it's not the vast expanse of every. But your focus is, I can't have that. And, 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 and Satan says, the only reason you can't have that is because God knows you become like him if you try it. You mean I can become like God? He's not fair. Let me have some of this. And with that, we were estranged from God. With that, we disobeyed and sinned from God. With that, sometimes God is just trying to let us know, be very careful. I'm, I'm telling you some things for your good, but our human nature wants us to go back to things God says we shouldn't have. And when I was at Hampton, Reverend Dr. Boyd, I just started smoking for just a, little, just a month. And at that time, there was no stigma against smoking, no, no Surgeon General's report. So it was not a stigma. I just wanted to start smoking and started smoking every day after dinner in the cafeteria. And it began to feel good. The food kind of had a different taste to it. And, and, and then I started uh, running, uh, Reverend Robinson. I was just running around the track, just trying to stay in shape. And I was noticing Elder Case that I used to be able to run a mile with no problem. But then I half a mile. <laughs> and I began to say, I got to stop. I, this, this isn't good for my health. And, and the thing I realized, this is just after a month, I had trouble stopping. Yeah, no, smoking is not going to get you out of heaven, but it will get you there quicker. And, and you have to be very careful. Some things that God restricts or questions or have us not has to do with the fact he knows the results. It is addictive. Anything that's addictive means it controls you and you do not control it. And, and God is putting cautions in life there will be things that you will become addicted to and sin is addictive and don't fool yourself and the longer you're in it the more you glory in it the more you like it until one day you try to get out and just like my smoking it's harder to get out than what you think that's why you need a savior if you did if you could get out of it on your own you would need a savior but the mere fact you can't get out lets you know that you need someone that can help you out. And so when God said, I, after the relationship was broken in the Garden of Eden, God sent his prophets. 
And he, they told us what God was saying, but we didn't listen. And then God sent his son to show us his love for us, and, but we didn't listen. And so in Revelation, God had to send his judgments like he did against Pharaoh, but we still didn't listen. And, and so finally, God is saying the judgments have all ceased. The, the, the verdict has been cast, and now I've made a new heaven and a new earth. And now I'm going to be with you, and I want you to know it's finished. I have perfected what I've started. What I started in the Garden of Eden that you tried to cancel has now been perfected. I have now perfected the fact that it is finished and I am going to be with you forevermore. What was broken now has been put back together in a perfected way. And anytime God does something, it's perfect. That's why we're calling it perfected praise. And if anyone wants to praise God for the fact that you have been reunited with him, all things have passed away, it's finished. All things have been made brand new, it's finished. John, write, write, write this down. It's finished because I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those of you who alphas know or know the Greek alphabet, alpha is number one. This is not meaning first. Some of you watched the Olympics, and it's a case by which persons were striving for the gold medal. This is not about being first. When he says he is the alpha, it means he's the source of all things. I, I am the first. and In other words, my mama and daddy are my alphas. They are the source of my being physically. But God is saying, before your mom and daddy, before your grandmom and daddy, before your great, before you're going, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, I was your source. And I am your source. I, I, I am your beginning. And then he says, I am the omega. And, and so for those of us omega, we, he, he is the end. And it does not mean the end in the sense, it doesn't mean like a dead end street you're, at the end it doesn't mean you come to the end of a book at the end it means i am the goal yes, sir. Yes. so during this football season training camp is just starting and the end of every team is to be the super bowl winner even though some prognosticators say that this team has no chance of winning their omega their their goal their, their end is to be the super bowl winners god, god is saying the goal that the end is that I will be the source of your life. Yes, yes. That in the end, yes, yes, uh, yes, you'll have goals and what you want to achieve in life, but in the end, it has to emanate from me. I am the reason you're existing. I am the reason you're alive. I, and I perfected that. And I, and I want you to know I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Our old folks said it ain't nobody <laughs> like Jesus. And so once he's your beginning, and once he's your end, everything in between is perfected. God is working all things together for your good. God wants you to know the relationship that Satan tried to break through the love and resurrection of his son, Jesus the Christ. We have now been reconciled, men and women to God. And in this reconciled and reconciliation, God wants you to know everything I have belongs to you. I won't keep any good thing from you who would not want to have that but old tricky satan old lying satan old deceiving satan wants you to think that what he has for you and what you think you can get on your own is better than what god has for you because sometimes god's delays make you think that is a denial and so all throughout revelation the martyrs those who have been standing up for christ uh, were wondering how much longer but when god finally shows up uh, it's greater than anything you could think or imagine great is his faithfulness i know what i'm talking about many of us were sitting at howard university chapel wondering at that time no money in our pockets 
wondering what God had for us in ministry, wondering if any ministerial doors would open. But hallelujah, look what God has done. Harry Seawright is a bishop in the Amy Church. Look what God has done. The Reverend Robert Child, PhD in ministry, distinguished now retired pastor. Look what God has done. Reverend Dr. Robert Childs uh, was on the Washington DC school board as a pastor. Look what God has done. And I'm just naming a few uh, of my brothers uh, and sisters. Uh, Reverend Dr. Susan Newman became high up in government. Look what God has done. At that time, we didn't know what was going to take place, Minister Robeson. But God worked it all together for good. If you hold on to God's unchanging hand, everything you need, God will provide. And he'll not only provide for it, it'll be perfected. Kennedy will be everything you stand in need of. Every dream you have, every aspiration you have, every desire you have, if you put it in God's hands, God will work it all out for your good. Why? Because I will give you the waters of living life. I will bring you to the fountain of living life. And whatever you need, I will provide. Well, what is he talking about, preacher? Well, this glass has water in it. And when I drink it, mm, it sure is good. On a hot day, this water is so good. And as you watch me drinking, it just seems so good. I keep on drinking it. So good. And somebody will say, well, it looks like it's run out. Somebody here today looks like your blessings have run out. Looks like your finances have run out. Looks like your joy has run out. It looks like your peace has run out. And folk who are around you are looking at an empty glass saying, where is your God now? Because it seems like your resources have run out. But I come to have good news. Even though this glass is empty, I know where the water fountain is. So anytime my glass gets empty, I can go to the water fountain and fill it up as many times as I want. God is letting us know in our lives you have access to the very fountains of the living of God so whatever you need God has it if you need more power God has it if you need a joy God has it if you need a healing God has it whatever you stand in need of God says my power my blessings my anointing my favor does not run out just go to the fountain a fountain that will never run dry. Yeah. Where did it come from? Well, it flows from the highest mountain. It goes to the deepest valley. How did it get there? Somebody hung high, stretched wide. They put his body into a tomb and there he died. But early Easter Sunday morning, it was perfected. That's when Satan tried to kill was perfected forever and ever and one day when this life is over we shall see him face to face yeah we shall see our perfected selves our perfect selves mortality shall take on immortality sin shall take on blessings death shall take on life shall live but until that day hold on your blessings your power your joy is on the way and God will perfect it that's why you can praise him that's why you can praise him that's why you can praise him today that's why you can praise him today that's why you can praise him today whatever it looks like Always remember, it's not what it looks like. The glass may look empty, but if you know where the water fountain is, you can drink again, <laughs> again, and again. Has anyone ever had their cup 
run dry and you did not know how you were going to make it and God showed up sometimes that's why we sometimes say that if you never had a problem if you never had an empty glass you never know that the Lord can solve it and through it all you will have some empty glass days you'll learn to trust in Jesus you'll learn to trust in God I'll never forget oh, it was a time by which Reverend Taylor we didn't know how we were going to pay our rent and Brett just finished seminary and sometimes I would just listen to great is thy faithfulness Dr. Boyd just so I could be encouraged and we were serving at Hemingway Memorial AME Church under Reverend Dr. William R. Porter and Mrs. Porter in Chapel Oaks, Maryland came back from the evening service rent at that time I think was maybe $225 a month we don't know how it got there but when we got back from church $200 was under our door we thought our glass had run dry but God miraculously filled it up to give us one more drink someone today in this third Sunday of August get ready this week God's gonna fill your cup this week the miracle you've been praying for is on the way this week God's going to provide for all of your needs according to his riches and glory. This week, Reverend Robinson, Isaiah shall be healed in Jesus' name. This week, God is going to move in such a way by which you'll know he's in charge. This week, Reverend Taylor, the door shall be opened, the way shall be made, and everything that seemed to be blocked, God is going to have you walk through, and you're going to be able to walk through with this. I don't know who God's speaking to today. But today, God wants you to know you can trust in Jesus. You can learn to trust in God.